Welcome to the Lover's Hole, a Patrick O'Brien podcast. As always, you're with Mike and Ian, and we are rereading the Aubrey Matron series of our favorite author, Patrick O'Brien. Ian, we got to finish up one of these last week, and we've got a special episode this week. What's in store? Oh, Mike, super exciting times here. We finished the final chapter of the Yellow Admiral last week with our heroes called back to duty in the official Navy after the escape from Elba of Napoleon Bonaparte. This week, though, Mike, we're taking a pause in the canon to bring everybody something very special that we've been working on for a little while. Uh, One of our Crossing the Line specials, and this one is all about audiobooks. Yeah, audiobooks seems like a very timely topic, but let's pause for a minute, take a little historical perspective. You know, we kind of looked into the early days of audiobooks, and in a recent article in The Atlantic, we got this. In 1883, Everett Nymanover, a Swedish scholar at the University of Minnesota, proposed a new invention that some thought would have a profound effect on the future of humankind. It was a device that played recordings of books. I mean, ever called the device a whispering machine and suggested that it could be placed inside of a hat so that someone walking down the street or reclining in bed could be perpetually listening to great works of literature. Sounds like it'll it'll never catch on. (laughs) That's right. That's right. Well, we kind of go ahead about, oh, what, 50 years. And in the 1930s, gramophone records are being made for the blind to be able to enjoy literature. And then in the 1980s, ah, the days of my early adulthood, (laughs) we have the event of cassette tapes and audiobook listening really starts to take off. Now, with digital media making, you know, people are making recordings themselves. um, It's much easier to own audiobooks And they were well established by the time the Patrick O'Brien novels were in their prime in the 1990s. Today, audiobook publishing, $4.5 billion US dollar market still seems to be growing with an audience that loves the audiobook experience, not the least of which the readers of our Patrick O'Brien books. Absolutely. And Mike, we went digging for any of O'Brien's own thoughts back in the early days about audiobooks. And we found this really, really great note from, I think, 93 or 94 that he had written, aimed at current readers of O'Brien books, I think. He says this. Recently, he says, several of my own books have been recorded. I have listened to them and to some others, and I've grown more convinced that my first notion is right. It is true that, so far, all of my books have been read by men, but one of them was introduced by a woman and her voice was as clear as a bell, exactly pitched for the novel I had written. Well, Mike, I I don't think we've been able to find out who the female narrator was. We're going to come back later on in today's show to some conversations about the, the potential appeal of a female narrator, which sounds really, really interesting. It must indeed be difficult for the manager of a recording firm to choose just the right reader for any given book. There are so many styles of reading from the flat, objective, business-like, wholly unemotional voice in which a practiced hand runs through the latest Wall Street quotations to the ambitious attempt at producing a different tone for every character and for each nuance of emotion. Clearly, a single voice can manage memoirs or a first-person narrative perfectly well. But equally clearly, no one man can convincingly impersonate a whole ship's company. Mm. He, he goes on to debate the topic that's been a hot topic for us and for many other O'Brien readers in the interim. He says, leaving gender aside for the moment, may I describe my ideal reader, calling him he for the sake of simplicity. He obviously has to be educated, although not ostentatiously so. Those who utter pedantically exact pieces of French or Spanish are as tiresome as those who are incapable of either. And he obviously has to learn any particular jargon his author would choose to employ. And he goes on and talks about some of the consequences of O'Brien's own jargon. He then goes on to describe his ideal reader as having the following attributes. He would avoid obvious emotion. Here we have it. 
He would avoid italics and exclamation marks like the plague. Trying to put life into flat prose is as useful as flogging a dead horse. And this is the point at which he mentions following Hamlet's guidance to the players. And if you know Hamlet or if you want to look it up, he's talking about the soliloquy from Act 3, Scene 2. It's the speech that you might remember where he talks about begetting a temperance that may give it smoothness and suiting the action to the word and the word to the action. He's generally telling them to tone it all down. He, going back to the ideal reader, he would also know his text through and through so that he reads it with full understanding. As for voice, if he is English, he must speak standard English, the Queen's English. If he is American, let him come from the West Coast or the moderately deep South. I think that's a nod to you there, Mike. (laughs) If he can be black with something of the splendid African depth and volume of Paul Robeson, it's a fairly narrow interpretation of black voices, but we'll take it. So much the better, though, even then, I personally should prefer him to be a woman. A kin, let us say, to Maureen O'Sullivan. So, Mike, there's a, there's a lot for us to dig into there, isn't there? There really is. You know, so I'm, I'm kind of wondering, do listeners share O'Brien's desire for a neutral, emotionally unengaged style of audiobook narration? Mm. Would they ever go for a female narration voice? And come to think of it, how do authors these days go about choosing and working with an audiobook narrator? And how come, in general, that audiobook listening has had such a great impact for listeners and their enjoyment of literature? And what became of the great relationship between audiobooks, narrators, and the Patrick O'Brien fan base back in the heyday? Yeah. Yeah. Well... To help us answer these questions and more, we've sought the help of four people who we think you'll be really excited to hear from. We've asked them to introduce themselves and to get us started by telling us how they first came across the idea of a Patrick O'Brien audiobook. Hi, my name is Steve Morris. I'm a filmmaker, a teacher, a podcaster, and a lover of Patrick O'Brien. But I started reading a book with my eyes like a sucker. And it wasn't until the third book, HMS Surprise, that I finally found the audiobooks and I never used my eyes again. Hello, Ian and Mike. Uh, My name's Chris Durbin. So I'm a writer of naval historical fiction. I've been for six years or so. I didn't really get into audiobooks until after I'd written my first normal book, if you like. But but then I got the first two published in audiobook, and now I'm getting all the others done in audiobook and catching up. And uh, so far, so good. Hi, I'm Simon Vance, and I'm one of the lucky audiobook narrators to have narrated the entire series of Patrick O'Brien's Aubrey Matcherin books. I first became aware of them when I was actually performing, because I'm an actor as well. But I was doing Billy Budd, and one of the cast members was reading all Patrick's books. Uh, and I thought I must do that sometime. And then a few years later, when the Master of Commander movie came out and my audiobook publisher, one of them, came to me and said, would you like to narrate this series? So that was two birds with one stone. I got to read it to myself and to a whole crowd of other people. My name is Sue Dennis. I am Patrick Tull's widow. We were married for 25 years. And at some time in the late 80s, early 90s, we took a cruise to Bermuda, and he had stopped by recorded books to get homework because he always did his homework. And we were going to dinner one night, and he said to me, you know, I'm reading this book, and uh, I really hope there's more. I really like them. Ooh. And it was Patrick O'Brien. So it's going to be fascinating to hear from all four of these great guests. Um, we're going to start with the perspective of a listener Let's start then with Steve Morris and talk about his experience as a listener. Well, it's funny. I I am an obsessive, crazy uh, audiobook listener and podcast listener. And it really started for me, I think, I didn't get this until much later, but I was obsessed with my parents' uh, musical albums. So I would listen to Camelot and My Fair Lady. And then I found out you could check out old time radio shows from the library. And so I started listening to Groucho Marx and Lone Ranger and all that stuff, not knowing that, oh, even though I love to read, that actually I love reading with my ears more than I love reading with my eyes. And so when audiobooks started to come out, my first one, I think, was Stephen King's Gunslinger, which is the first of the Dark Tower series. And that's probably in the Mm. early 90s that I found that. And I listened to it over and over and over again. 
And then I started to discover, oh, some of these other books like Patrick O'Brien, they actually had them on books on tape at the time, which you would send away for and they would mail you the cassettes, then you mail them back. And so once I started on those, I never went back. So what do you think makes the, the audiobook experience so much different from, from turning the page and taking it off paper? I think, you know, there's a lot of studies that show that there are people who are visual learners and audio learners and who learn in different ways. And so part of it is what syncs up with you. So I think for me, my brain just works better with hearing the spoken word than it does reading. And then over time, I started to speed up the audio book. So now yeah. I listen to them at two and a half to three times speed. Wow. Uh, because like I said, I'm a crazy person. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and so it allows me to go through so many books and podcasts and lectures, which I just love. And frankly, if I, the reason, part of the reason I love doing that is if I am doing anything else, I'm watching the dishes, I'm exercising, I'm driving the car, I'm taking a walk, whatever I'm doing, you will see me with headphones in my ears because I always am listening to a book or a podcast. Now, I wonder what the experience is like from the other side. You know, for an author, we asked Chris Durbin. Very early on, I was approached by a publisher, an American publisher, to, to publish the first book and then the second one as audiobooks. They then chose not to take them further. And I can kind of understand that because for a traditional publisher, the volumes in this genre are not great. And they've got to really think carefully before they take these things on because they're putting money up front. They, they're innovation, right. paying for all the other things that go around publishing. So I was kind of left in limbo then. And for about two years, I was wondering what to do. And I suppose what really spurred me on in the end was I had an email from somebody who was partially sighted and saying, look, I've read the first two. Have, have you, have you given up on us? You know, what, what, what's going on? Wow. So, so that spurred me to actually sit down and find out how to do this. Um, huh. The one thing I knew I didn't want to do is to get another publisher because I didn't want to be, yeah. um, it, it sounds a bit harsh to say held to hostage by them, but that's kind of yeah. what I felt at right. the time. So I looked at the way that Amazon does this. So I published yeah. Amazon for, all, for my paperbacks and my, uh, my Kindles and so on. And they have a, a, a system called ACX, which allows you to, do audiobooks. And it is remarkably simple, quite time consuming, but very simple. Essentially, what you do is you put, um, I think it's 500 words or, you know, quarter of a chapter or something out there and ask for auditions. You state what you're looking for. In my case, I wanted a male voice. I wanted a British voice. And I wanted somebody who could sound a bit authentically 18th century and nautical. And, and I got well, it's about 29. Uh, tapes came in, and and my wife wow. sat down and listened to them all to try and uh, try and try and get the one we wanted. It was actually easier than it sounds because I suppose I suppose of those twenty nine, well over twenty were from the our Jim Lad school of naval speech, you know, and and they would have been great if if I was writing a pirate story, but but they were yeah. easy to 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 uh, put aside. And the others we just listened to and listened to and listened to until we narrowed it down to the one we wanted. Then we went through the process of, you know, how much they will do it for. So, you know, it's kind of a, uh, you know, will you accept this amount of money? No, will you accept it? You know, that, that sort of thing. Um, and eventually we came to, uh, to, to an agreement. Um, and happily, the same narrator, David Lane Pusey, is now uh, hoping to do all of my books. And I hope he will because he does a great job and, you know, I don't want to have to change again. Um, so, so that's essentially how I do it now. Would it be easier if I had a traditional publisher doing it? Yes, yeah, certainly it'd be easier, but I would yeah. lose control of it. Right. I, I you know, I, for example, I, I would have no say over when they were published, over who the narrator was, um, over yeah. what the cover art looked like. So, so I'm much more comfortable taking control of all of that and doing it myself. So we're, I think we're up to, I think we're, I'm just looking at my shoulder at my book collection here. I think we're up to book six at the moment. And I think he's probably working on book seven. And, and coincidentally, by the time he's done all the books up to wherever he gets to, wherever I've got to at that point, hopefully by then I will be out of contract with the first publisher and he'll be able to do the first two for me again. Oh, okay. excellent. So, right. Yeah. That's where, where I am with audio publishing. Terrific. So 
now we're up to the point in the process where the author's ready for their new book to be narrated. It's time to hear from award-winning narrator Simon Vance about his first steps in narrating the Patrick O'Brien audiobooks. Yeah, well, I've been a, an audiobook narrator for, for 40 years, um, pretty much, beginning in the 80s in London when I was a, a BBC Radio 4 newsreader, and I, I donated time for free to the RNIB's Talking Book Service for the blind and partially sighted. Uh, and so I was doing it for fun, and then I uh, immigrated to California in 1992, uh, and I was going to be an actor full-time over here, and I did a lot of theatre and a bit of TV and film, but... Um, Somebody mentioned to me that they do actually pay you to record audiobooks. So I started recording audiobooks because it filled in the time. And turns out I was quite good. I'd sort of served an apprenticeship in London in those 10 years. And um, a couple of the companies I work with uh, kept me busy through the years. But it was very slow. It was just a backup. And, of course, then the uh, iPod was invented, you know, MP4 players, and then the iPod in the aughts. And the business took off. And Blackstone was sending me books every month. And I think it was because of the the release of their movie, Master and Commander. Suddenly, those books came to prominence again. And Blackstone got the rights at that time to to do a, a, a version. And I remember being uh, auditioned, as it were. I and mean, the woman, Hala was her name, uh, Blackstone, based in Ashland, Oregon. She called me and said, look, could you could you give us a sample? We want to see... Uh, if you can do sort of battle scenes and that kind of activity, because up to that point, I've been doing books for them for nearly 10 years. Yeah. Um, and I was like, really, you want me to audition? Oh, well, OK. So <laughs> I uh, I did and they were happy with it. And I got the first book. And, and uh, over the next three years, I recorded the whole series of 21 right to the very end. Anything, Simon, looking back on that, um, that you found particularly enjoyable or particularly challenging? in narrating that 21 book series? Well, I, I mean, it's all enjoyable because I love the challenges. <laughs> so it was both enjoyable and challenging. Um, all good books have their challenges, but because they're good books, you don't mind them. You know, the Patrick O'Brien series, it's a fun, rollicking series. I mean, it's up and down. You know, some are really good books and some are, yeah, that's okay, but it's still all the same characters and they're so adorable. You just want to hug them every time you come across them. But yeah, the challenges of so many characters, the challenges as you get with any long series of, of you know, characters appearing in one book, not appearing in a couple and coming back and you have to remember how you voiced them. And I'm not sure I got it right every time, but, <laughs> but I'm sure there are people out there who've probably listened to them more than once who can go, oh, Simon got that one wrong. But it's 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 the fun of it. And, and those are part of the challenges. And of course, it's, it's a historical book based on truths of language and yeah. names and so on. So you, there's a certain level of accuracy you have to, mm. to check on. I always loved Jack Aubrey and Stephen Maturin mm. as as people. Um, but I and, and of course, particularly love their, their playing off each other. Uh, yeah. It's glorious. There's so many individual characters. Barely any of them I could name right now because it's been so long. And I, I, my own, my memory of it is of just a wonderfully enjoyable time from beginning to end. You know, you, it's, it's, as I'm sure all the fans of Patrick O'Brien at the time just wanted it to go on. And yeah. had he lived, it would have gone on, I'm sure, for many more. And, and I can't tell you the sadness of reading those, is it three chapters or something? Yeah. 21 that, um, and, and it just, ends and it doesn't and they're sailing off and it's it's heartbreaking heartbreaking to let go of those people it must have been very odd to try and make something out of 21 as well because it's not a whole intact story the dialogue probably wasn't completely written out i don't know did you ever think of saying no to 21 (laughs) no no in fact i think i pressed for it I don't think they were prepared to go for it. I said, no, we've got to. I don't care. And and here's the thing, you know, when I narrate a book, uh, it's hard to say because I don't want to, when we when we talk to new narrators or people learning to become audiobook narrators, you say, well, you've got to read the book. You've got to understand the story. There's a beginning, middle, and end. You've got to know where you're going and whatever. Without You don't then sort of signal what's happening. But it's good to have that knowledge. But after you've done 20 books in a series, you... Every day is just another day. You just carry yeah. on. And, and when you get to 21, you, you know these people so well, you don't need to know where they're going at the end of the book. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it would be nice to know now where they were going. But, you know, we never did. We never found out. But, but they were doing things. They were living. It's, oh, gosh, 
this is going to an interesting place, but it's like the end of the Sopranos or something, you know, yeah. life goes on and then suddenly it stops. Yeah. But you don't, you don't know it's going to stop until it stops. And so yeah. I can't, I couldn't read those three, those chapters knowing that they were going to end because that meant nothing in those days beforehand. It nice. just came to an end and it's heartbreaking. It's making me sad now thinking about it, but it's, oh. that's the way it was. So it, there was no, there was no issue. There's nothing different about doing that book other than the, 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 the sadness, the emotional uh, pressure on you. We spoke as well to Chris Durbin about the economics of audiobooks. What does it mean for an author to have an audiobook? How does it feature in their plans? And what does it mean to them in terms of revenue? How do you find it? the sales of, of, say, paperbacks versus Kindles versus Kindle Unlimited versus audiobooks? Where, how do you find that stack? Right, so, so, so in volume, it goes something like this. By far the biggest is Kindle Unlimited, which is about 65% of, uh, of, by volume, not by, um, by revenue. Um, about 25% is Kindles, actually selling a Kindle book as opposed to, to uh, a subscription. About 7% is paperback. And about three percent is audiobook. So, okay. so you can. That's still really low. Is, yeah. Plenty of room there for more really on audiobooks. Yeah, right? and I'm not sure how to increase that. In fact, I'm not even sure who listens to them. So, so I hate to bring up the horrible subject of uh, of finance here. Yeah. But mm. audiobooks are a bit of a leap into the dark for independent authors. So, so there are two ways of doing right. it. You can either approach an narrator and say. You do it for nothing, but you share all the profits with me, 50-50. Yeah. Or you can say, I will pay you for the narration, and then you just walk away after that, and, it, and, it, and it's all mine. That's the one I've chosen. Um, I'm hoping that it will break even in about two or three years after each book, which is quite a long time, actually. Yeah. But I have no wait. real confidence that it will, it's only because of this 3% figure. It's very difficult to, to make your money out of it. I, I, I was at a, a, a literary um, meeting many years ago where, where, where somebody was berating the author who was speaking because they had not brought it out on audio. And, and he quite hard-heartedly said, I can't make money on it. He said, you know, if, right. if I thought I could make money on it, I'd do it, but I'm not a charity. And I thought at the time, oh, it's a mean attitude. But I see exactly what he meant because... Yeah. You know, it's hard enough to make make a living as an author anyway. And if you're then going to siphon some of this off into audiobooks, you have to be really clear as to how that's going to go. So that's speak right. to me again in, say, two years' time. I'll be able to tell you whether that's worked. And no conversation about O'Brien audiobooks would be complete without mentioning Patrick Tall. So we wanted to hear from Sue. How did her Patrick get started? And how did he come to the O'Brien books? I became a listener of Patrick O'Brien books. Patrick Tell and I listened um, to all of his books and the O'Briens, especially we listened to on long trips. Mm. Other books that, uh, that he had, we seemed to be doing a lot of long traveling when um, in the nineties. And um, I usually grabbed a book, um, on my way uh, out the door in the car. So, um, you know, the John Masters books, uh, the um, Lumpole books. Mm -hmm. um, Lumpole was one of Patrick's favorites. Um, he, he had a lot of fun with that. Mine too. He also did the Ellis Peters Cadfail books. Very early, before he started the O'Brien books, he was doing Cadfails on a very regular basis. Also very kind of char character driven, lots of history, lo lots of kind of drama in them as well. Sounds like he'd have had a lot of fun doing those. Exactly. Exactly. Um, he also did the Sharps. Dickens was probably his favorite. He really nice. enjoyed doing Dickens because of the character development, I believe. Um, yeah. But uh, he really did enjoy doing the um, uh, Patrick O'Brien books. And of course, um, during the 90s, um, he had started the books and then uh, suddenly got a call from Norton um, saying that Patrick O'Brien was coming over. Remember when he was doing his first tour? He was doing a, a lecture at the Yale Club, and I think that was the first time we met him. What was your impression of him? And, and I'm really interested as well. What, what do you think 
his initial response to audio book recording would have been as an author? I think he wanted it always to be very flat. He he and yeah. uh, Patrick Tull felt that people would um, would need an accent, and and he was very careful about making sure that he had the appropriate accent. Yeah. Um, Patrick O'Brien wanted it to be very very flat and level, and and Patrick Tull just disregarded it. Good, thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> It's probably worth saying at this point that if you haven't read up to and beyond the first chapter of The Hundred Days, you might want to skip ahead 30 seconds or so while we hear from Sue Dennis about one particular character-driven event that had a big impact on Patrick Tull. You know, because we've, we've talked about different narrators and their different approaches. I kind of wondered what was it about O'Brien's work that, you know, meant a lot of Patrick Tull and, and vice versa here. Uh, I think he loved the period of history. I, and mm-hmm. I think he loved the characters. Uh, for instance, when Diana died, he was deeply upset. Oh, just deeply, deeply upset by that. Uh, we, had, we had several long conversations about it and I kept saying, um, that's very sad, but it's a character in a book. It's a character. It's very sad. <laughs> so, Mike, it's probably interesting to stop at this point and just reflect back on O'Brien's own interest in female narrators. We, we've got a world today where I think most people's choices for narrators of Patrick O'Brien audiobooks are, are of the male variety. What do you think about this idea of potentially a female narrator for audiobooks and for, for something like an O'Brien book in particular? Well, it, it's fascinating. I mean, uh, right now, I th- I think the split between male and female narrators is is almost exactly even, and it's really you know female narrators have come kind of into their own over the last couple of years. I mean, you know, yeah, really yeah. starting to catch up and close that what was a big divide. Um, now, some online authors claim that you know publishers tend to default to the author's gender, the book author's yeah. gender, but. Female listeners outnumber male listeners in general. You know, perhaps not for Patrick O'Brien, but we know there are a lot of female readers. So I'm I'm fascinated by the idea. Now, for me personally, I love a lot of dual narration books where right. we've got right. if we've got key female characters, key male characters, you know, you've you've got different folks doing that. And having said that, I will say, and I've I've you know, as you know, major, major audiobook fan here. I've got yeah. you know, literally <laughs> thousands in my, in my library, but I certainly can quote great examples of both genders doing books where they're handling the voices of other genders just yeah. absolutely yeah. flawlessly. So I'm, I'm fascinated. How about you, Ian? What do you think? Well, I can't think of any audiobook narrations that I've listened to lately that are by females. And I think that's just an accident that I've listened to books that have male authors. And like we said, the uh, publishers have gone with the gender of the author. I think a female voice for Patrick O'Brien could be really great. Now, partly because we'd get a female take on the first person um, world of Sophie and Diana, but just because the way that the kind of clarity and emotional richness might come across, I think it could be really, really great. So listeners of the show, tell us what you think. Hit us up on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash lovers whole on Twitter, at Whole Lubbers, what do you think about the appeal of a potential female narrator for Patrick O'Brien? We're nowhere near, I think, to having a lobby or a voice in the industry, but what do you think? Would you enjoy listening to O'Brien read by a female voice? I, I think we've certainly got a pretty solid interest from you and me, right, Mike? Oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, for me, just the and, – and, and I think a number of our listeners have said this – you know, we, we may have our favorites, but each time we hear O'Brien from a different narrator, we pick up something different. We, you know, it enhances that experience. So, yeah. you know, I, I, I agree. I, and I'm really fascinated to hear what our listeners think. Definitely. We're going to come back to the subject of the diversity of the narratorship in more detail in, in a little while. But Mike, maybe this is a good point for us to just take a quick pause Um, If everybody's vocal cords are getting a bit fried, why don't you go and grab a glass of something soothing and join us in a couple of minutes after this short break. If you're enjoying the podcast and if you're listening to the show before September 5th, 2023, would you consider helping us out and heading over to the British Podcast Awards website and casting a vote 
in the listener's choice category. Go to www.britishpodcastawards.com forward slash voting and let's see where we get to. Welcome back from the break. Um, You know, I think when we get right down to it, you know, we're talking about what makes the audiobook experience so distinctive for the listener. Well, let's hear from our super listener, Steve Morris. I think, of course, the main difference is that you have this intermediary between you and the source material. So if you're just reading the book, well, then it's your imagination. You're creating the voices in your head. And that could be an absolutely fantastic experience. And if you have a really crappy reader, which sometimes the audiobook readers aren't that good, well, then it's it's a net negative, you know, because they're bringing down the book. But if you have a fantastic reader like Patrick Tull, then they're actually elevating the material for in several different ways. One is they've read it more closely than you've read it if you're reading it for the first time. And yeah. so they're and particularly with Patrick O'Brien, where there's so much subtlety and there's so much subtext that if you're just reading it yourself the first time, not that you're not going to have a great time and you will. But there's all these little things going on with the characters because particularly with Patrick O'Brien, he doesn't spoon feed you anything. He doesn't tell you what these characters are always thinking. He doesn't tell you exactly what a thing meant. He doesn't go like, and now we have resolved our conflict or now we are going to do this. It just sort of happens. And so having a reader who understands what's happening as Patrick Dolt does so well, well, then you understand the nuance, the humor, the subtlety, the difficulty, the awkwardness, all that is coming through with the way he portrays those characters. Do you have a favorite passage that might illustrate that job that he does of bringing it to life? So I'll tell you something interesting about the books, which is that when my friend Dave Draffin, who first recommended the books to me in 1991, Mm -hmm. he said, listen, just get through the first book. And by the time you get halfway into Post Captain, you'll be hooked. And so I found Master and Commander good, but I didn't blow me away. And then I was hooked to Post Captain. Since that time, Master and Commander has actually probably become my favorite of the books. Like, because every time I would go back to it, I would, I would find more there. And, and part of it is the joy of just having these two characters get to meet in Mrs. Hart's concert. Like, that's just wonderful. But when you ask about passages, there are two passages that I have gone back to in Master and Commander that I absolutely love. The first is it's Stephen has been put ashore and he is walking up the familiar path in Spain. And it's just his internal thought process as he's thinking about things that's just so beautifully described. And the other one is the conversation with Stephen and Dylan on the boat where they finally drink a bottle of booze and they get to talk with each other. And then Dylan at the end says something like, I feel I haven't expressed myself well. Perhaps it would be, have been better if we hadn't spoken at all. It's something like that. And it is just a miraculous passage because what's so great about O'Brien is he's so restrained mm. that when he kind of lets you in to his poetry and to the depth of human emotion that he's able to carry, it will blow you away. Really, really. Yeah, yeah. The fascinating thing about his writing. So I, I teach writing and mm-hmm. – one of the things about it, I'm a, I'm a structure guy. And so working with my students, it's always like, well, you introduce this in order for you to deliver this. And that's how my brain works in terms of a story. What Patrick O'Brien does is so much more sophisticated because what he does is he'll introduce a thing and you feel like you're heading towards this thing. And then he'll take a left turn yeah. and you won't get that thing at all. So you never get the confrontation between Jack and Dylan that you've been building to the whole book. Mm. You never get the final reveal with Stephen or all these things. And he takes you. So it's like, no, Dylan's dead. And now we move on. It's the same with Clumford where it's like, you're building all yeah. this stuff. And some of the stuff you, because actually that's how life is. I'm always drawn to the yeah. John Lennon line of life is what happens when you're busy making other plans. And <laughs> good which I think is 100% truth. And that is also 100% Patrick O'Brien. We're planning to go to South America for this revolution. That is not what's going to happen. You know, (laughs) something else is going to happen. Great stuff. We also wanted to hear how a narrator gets to be paired up with a particular work or a particular author. So let's hear on that subject from Simon Vance. Simon, how do you as a narrator get get paired up with a particular work? How much say do you have in in what you do and, and, and 
Don't As a rule, I have very little say because I'm ah. work for hire. You know, um, yeah. the publishers I work for uh, have a certain certain books come to them, or they own them, or whatever, and they they look for a narrator and they go, "This would match Simon," or they'll say, "Let's audition a few." Um, I, I auditioned for one. I, I was so sad I missed it. I missed out on it. But they went to the right person. It was actually a, another narrator who's done some done, done some Patrick O'Brien's. John Lee. Yeah. He wow. did some back in the day. He didn't do the whole lot. But he's from, he's from Black Country, uh, yeah. that, er, uh, that area. But he, this book was um, Bernie Taupin's autobiography. You know, oh, fascinating. Jones. So, and, yeah. and I was just so thrilled to get the order. And I, I know it read really well. I think he probably, yeah. I mean, he's a, he's a writer of, of uh, you know, poetry, if you like, but uh, it read really well. So whether he did it himself or had some other, I don't know. But um, I, I did the audition and then I didn't hear anything other than that he didn't get it. And then I, I met oh. John because we're friends down here and he got it. And uh, I, I withheld throwing my beer in his face, but <laughs> <laughs> you, damn you, you got it. Oh. But that's the way uh, a lot of the stuff will come to you. I audition for a few, very few, but it's usually high profile ones where they're, they're not sure what's going to work best. And, and sometimes they just want something to be able to show to the author. Mm, because yeah. these days, back in the old days, the author's because they didn't know about audiobooks much, they didn't say, I want the audio rights. I want to be able to decide how my books are going to sound. So the publishers made those decisions. So, you know, which was great for us because you got on with your publisher and the publisher kept sending you books. And I got everything. I, back in the day, I did, I've done a whole range. You know, there's well over a thousand audiobooks. Right. lost count years ago. But, um, yeah, it's a little more specific now because the authors want input, uh, understandably. Uh, so, so yeah, we're, we're more likely to audition, but I still just get a lot of books that are, are sent to me off the cuff. You know, I'm doing a, uh, an insert. It's one of those I mentioned before about how they're now doing different voices where I might have done the whole book. Now I'm only doing an hour or so, or somebody else might have done the whole yeah. book, but this is a Daniel Mason book, uh, Northwoods, I think I we're recording it now. And I, a friend is doing the main narration and I think there's another voice. And I'm doing just a, a chapter of a character that's uh, from Northamptonshire, but he's in North America around the time of the revolution and so on. So I've been listening to some more Northamptonshire accents to get that. I did a lot of work with Alan Moore when he did Jerusalem, which was a huge book of his. Mm. Um, and he's Northampton born and bred. Yeah. And uh, so I've, I've experienced doing that. But, um, but yeah, I didn't have to audition for this one hour. The publisher knows me. So they just, it came across the table. There's only one occasion where I, I went to the publisher. Well, I, I mentioned 21 where I yeah. pushed for that, but I didn't have mm -hmm. to push right. very hard. And then uh, I, I've always loved Titus Grown, Titus Alone, oh, yeah. Gorman Gast. Gorman Gast. Um, yeah, yeah. And I've loved those books. And I went to Blackstone, one of my early publishers, early on, and said, I really, really want to do these. And they were like, nah, I don't know. And then they ended up, <laughs> I'm sure not like that. That was me pretending. I'm, they're much more. Um, civilized than that but they, uh, i i went uh, they they uh, i think pbs showed the uh, tv series there was a tv mm -hmm. series and sting playing steer pike i think and suddenly it was a little bit there you know had a little more of a public awareness and uh, they sent the books to me but that's the, pretty much the only time that i've done it as a result of pushing to do a book specifically other than that i've been very fortunate and and i do get authors now who specifically asked for me so that's been good I'll bet. Right. oh great now we've got a great character on the page we've got a great performer behind the mic but what kind of preparation takes place let's start with author chris durbin and then hear from steve morris you listen to to david's work um, do you guys talk a bit about ideas or characters or tone at yes. all? Or well, we, well, yes. I, I suppose the short answer is we did, but but having you know for the first couple of books, but now he he just kind of rolls with it. Um, ah, he, he, you nice. know the way the system's set up, I'm supposed to get him to re-audition each time. Well, we don't do that because clearly right. he knows what he's doing. What we do is a, a, a short, just to make sure that. The pacing's right and so on at the start of each book. Uh, and then as a new character is introduced, I'll, I'll, I'll do a quick, you know, who is this character and, and, and what's he about or she is about. So I, so I suppose all, each of my books has a new principal character come in. Um, and often, oh, yeah. uh, often they're French or Spanish or, or Dutch or something. So we have to talk about how that works. But I, I very much, um, 
listen to his advice, actually, because he does seem to understand, well, I seem to, he does understand you know, the way that these, that these characters' voices are going to sound and uh, you know, how authentic they need to be and uh, whether that's going to work or not as, a, as an audiobook. Yeah, and you say perform your performance with these words, and yes. then you kind of know that he's yes. going to take it yes. in the right direction. Yes, but but, but for example, um, book. Uh, let me think now. Book book book. We have thirty there. Uh, th- book twelve has a has quite a strong French character in it. I, I won't ah. bore you about the chat, but he's a quite an inspirational character actually, and mm. and and I need his voice to be spoken and to be spoken correctly. So think about yeah. that. Yes. What else do you think is going on in in the greatness of the work of one of these narrators to translate written words into a performance? What, what do you think they have to do to get there? Well, it's funny. So I have a, a very close friend who was acted in a movie for me, and she is now this this is her main gig is doing yeah. audiobooks. Mm-hmm. And her name is Kathleen Early, and she's a, has a fantastic voice. And I know from talking to her about her process is obviously she reads the book first. Then she highlights every line in the book with the color of each character Mm -hmm. so that she knows that it's because as you're reading along, because I've done, I don't know if you, I think you have kids. If you did this, if you're reading books to your kids, if you did voices for all the characters Mm -hmm. in the book. Well, I I love doing voices. That was super fun. But sometimes in terms of who, where it says Jack said blank. Well, sometimes that Jack isn't for three lines down. So you come to the Jack line and you actually don't know that it's Jack until later. Well, obviously, if you're doing the audiobook, you have to know before you get there. So Kathleen will highlight every line. She'll think about each of the characters. She'll develop a voice for each of those characters. And then it's just exactly like acting, which is acting is what is the subtext? And subtext means what is the meaning behind the words? So I could be saying, yeah. you okay? And you okay could be anything from genuine concern about whether or not you're actually okay to you're acting like a moron you need to you need to go home and stop and it's the subtext that tells the actor how to deliver that line and particularly with a character like steven who's all subtext yeah there's always so much going on in his lines whereas jack is thinking at the moment he's speaking as he's thinking he isn't he doesn't have i mean he ends up being as steven would say a very deep file and he really is in lots of ways but he also is just words come out of his mouth. And so yeah, he yeah. doesn't have that thought process. And so that's how you have to deliver those lines. Right. Jack's an extrovert. And I guess it's easier to play extroverts in some way. Whereas introverts, you have to kind of draw it out with them in, in the performance. I, I, I wouldn't say easy or hard. It depends. It depends on the actor. Like okay. I think now this goes in, in, I would say it also goes to, there is a huge difference between voice acting and film or theater acting, yeah. which is that playing the introvert in a film or a play well it could be in that look that you see the look that the person gives and that yeah. makes helps you understand what they're thinking or their gesture or their body position or things like that yeah. in a book in an audio book you don't have any of those visual tools so you have to do them with the hesitation or the pace of how you speak or things like that to create mm-hmm. those characters one other thing to add to it the other difference with all of this is that you're not just speaking the words that someone is speaking you're speaking their thoughts and you're speaking the narration, you know? And so the, there's there's also like, well, what is the tone? And this is a lesson I learned about writing much, much later, but because I didn't write a lot of prose. But what's interesting is that you can be writing the narration, which is saying Stephen is doing this or doing that. But within that narration is clues, and Patrick O'Brien, again, one of the greatest at this, are clues to the emotional state of the character or the thought process. So the way that the narration is written when you're with Stephen is different fundamentally from the way the narration is written when you're with Jack, because Stephen is more introspective. He's more intellectual. Jack is more straightforward. In fact, the, 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 I don't, it would be very interesting to see how the book is weighted in terms of how much time we spend with Stephen's thoughts versus Jack's thoughts. And it's a yeah. lot more with Stephen. And let's go back to Simon Vance again. You know, we wanted to know what goes on behind the curtain, if you will, as he's preparing for an audiobook narration. Simon, we've seen you described as a specialist in single voice narration. Can you tell us a little bit about what that means? Uh, well, well, it's that, uh, there is only one narrator. There is only one. There can be only one. Um, one of my favorite movies, Highlander. <laughs> anyway, it's, it's changing somewhat now because there's a lot about authenticity. If you get a book that's got four points of view, four different people, 
these days they will hire four different actors, mm -hmm. four yeah. different performers, uh, which is a good thing. It's great. There's a lot of you know, problems with cultural appropriation and people yeah. doing funky accents and not doing them well and so on and so forth. And and so it can be embarrassing if you, if you make a mistake like that. But I, I used to pride myself on doing a pretty good job. Uh, I remember one particular one, The Prestige. Mm. Oh, okay. Christopher Priest, The Prestige. It, they made a movie of it. Yeah, they made a movie yeah. with Christian Bale. Christian Bale, that. yes, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And, and yeah, about magicians, uh, and yeah. it was written. Uh, I think five people. I don't want to give away the story because that's sort of integral to how many people are narrating or whatever. But yeah. but there's there's <laughs> okay. a woman, there's a there's a young journalist in modern day England who I think was from Manchester, and and there were the magicians themselves back in the day, and so I think there were five different things and i i did them all and i i love that and i think it came down it came on came off pretty well i did i did a book it was uh, set in the caribbean i, I made friends with christopher priest the author i, lo I love his work and, and he's a lovely guy and, and uh, he very much liked what i did for that book. but the uh, the other one i did was a caribbean mystery thriller i think mm. it was a thriller but it, it involved um you know caribbean voices uh, mm. narrating whole chapters yeah. and um a, 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 an English detective sergeant who was sent over to the Caribbean and a couple of others. And the author, who is a professor of English somewhere, actually wrote to me personally and said she enjoyed what I did. That's, you know, that was of its time. These days, yeah. that would you'd get the individual actors because they're so a much bigger pool to draw from. Yeah. So to answer your question, the single voice is that, is me doing right. everything, Got all it. the characters. And, and uh, yeah, uh, that's... Uh, that can be a lot of pressure, need a lot of research. For the Caribbean one, I spent a lot of time because it was many years ago. Uh, and I think I've just managed to log into uh, some online radio stations coming out of Jamaica and a few others and just listen to those for hours in the day to, to get the accent. I couldn't do it now just off the cuff, but, uh, right. uh, you know, to get some authenticity. And that's the way I tend to do accents is by listening. Okay. So tell us then a bit more about the process. If you've got... I don't know what the unit of activity is, a session's worth or a chapter. How would you go about preparing? What does it take to get kind of words off the page into you being mm. ready to perform? Yeah. You know, it's a... So I'm presented with a book. Um, yeah. For example, there's Patrick O'Brien's 10, 14 hours long. You, you to sort of calculate how long it's going to take you. I tend to break it down like that. I'll, I'll, I'll test, depending on the size of the text, the size of the pages and so on, I'll work out how long it takes to do a page by reading a few of them. Then I'll calculate how long the book's going to take. I used to try to get three finished hours a day. And I do two nice. hours in the morning, one hour in the afternoon. That's finished hours. Yeah. Uh, how long that takes depends on the difficulty of the narration. And that can depend on so many things, the style of the writer, whether they're a good writer and it's easy to read, whether they're a difficult writer and they use a lot of sub clauses or whatever, or very strange twists yeah. of language and you have to keep retaking sentences. So that can vary a lot. But I used to get two hours done in the morning, one hour in the afternoon. Um, and so three hours a day. So a 10 or 14 hour book would take about a week. Um, and I, I've reduced that now because I'm older and creakier. Yes. Um, my voice doesn't hold up and, and uh, so I'll do two hours a day, okay. uh, but there's still a lot of work around all that. So it sounds simple, but there's a lot more with a book that if it's a, a new book, uh, or a, from a series or something, I don't know, uh, or, a, a, you know, a mystery story, I will yeah. pretty much need to read it beginning to end just so I know who the good guys are, who the bad guys are, who's doing okay. what, who's presented to be someone else, who's not, who's, and also to get a sense of the language of the, of the author and, and basically understand the story. So that's usually, I do that in advance. You know, sometimes I've yeah. got time. I'm doing a book next week, next Monday, and I'm about to start the prep this week. So okay. I fairly like week. So I'll just sit and read and stuff. And, um, it's, yeah. So, uh, um, and I'll I'll pick out if I need to look up words. I'll that's when I'll I'll right. highlight them. I'll probably have a um, an Excel spreadsheet of all the pronunciations. The nice thing for me is I work alone, um, ninety nine percent of the time. I don't have a director yeah. online. I'm not sitting in a studio with a with okay. an engineer or whatever. It's very much myself. So my time is my own. I yeah. can take as long as I like without having to worry about the studio racking up bills for engineers and whatever. So you know I will record. 
And if I come across a word, I go, I think I said it this way last. I think then I'll, I'll check it on the Excel spreadsheet and then I'll. So that's what means one finished hour will often take longer. Yeah. If there's nothing much to look up, I'm a very good reader. I'm a good sight reader and I can take it off the text off the page and I can record an hour in about an hour and 10 minutes because okay. you make flubs here and there, mistakes and so on. So you need to retake. So an hour and 10 minutes. And I, what I do is I, my process is, uh, audiobook narrators work in two different ways. One is uh, punch and roll, where they'll make a mistake and then roll back and, and run a little bit before that, and it'll drop into record, and then they'll go on, yeah. and that's the finished product. I tend to do a straight record where I'll leave the mistakes in, but I'll make marks. Yeah. So you know, if I make a flub, I'll just drop a marker and I'll start again on that sentence or something, and then afterwards I spin through and edit. And because yeah. of my days at the BBC, uh, I was in local radio and I used to do all the woo, 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 woo editing with yeah, a razor yeah, blade yeah. <laughs> and yellow sticker tape and stuff. So I, my eye is very good for digital editing and I'm, I'm very quick at cleaning up messes. I'm sure your engineer is excellent at that too. Um, he certainly is. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's the way it, it, it sort of, that takes the time. And it, so I can do an hour and about an hour and 10, an hour and 15, or it could be an hour and 45. Mm. One of our listeners, you know, was just completely puzzled. He said, how come we never hear the pages turning? Ah, well, the easy answer is because we don't turn pages anymore. It's iPads. Yeah. Ah. You know, and there's, that was an interesting move because, I mean, I remember, as I say, I started recording over here in 93. And there were occasions, most of the time, the publishers would send a huge stack of paper. You know, there'd be a, a you know, a Xerox or something, you know, huge, yeah. that's an old word, but, you know, they'd, they'd send a whole stack and there'd be a lot of FedExing backwards and forwards. And what you do with those sheets, you generally put three in front of you. And if you make a mistake at some point in one of them, you could use that break in to, to move them along. Otherwise, you would have to then, you, otherwise you would deliberately stop, move them and then start again. So there'd be an edit, you know, you pick up. Yeah. There was a thing that one of my friend, fellow narrators uh, introduced me to it's called Widows and Orphans. And it was basically, if you had a sentence that ran on from the bottom of one page to the top of the next of a printed page, you'd write, and I can't remember which was the widow and which was the orphan, but you'd either write the end of the sentence at the bottom of the first page or the beginning of the sentence at the top of the second, so that you, the break when you turned the page was edited out, but you had the sentence to continue on which was, I think I did it once, but you imagine a book of 400 of pages prep. and you do oh, that. Yeah. It's so much prep work. So basically, I, you know, you'd move three pages along and you either memorize what the previous sentence was or something like that. But yeah, uh, or, the, or the other thing we used to do, which was even worse, was I'd have the book itself and I'd have to take a razor blade and cut the pages out, all the pages oh. out. But of course, then you have the pages on double two sides. So right. you've got, all right. you you can't put three in front of you. You've got to move the page over. So there's again the widows and orphans comes into play to some extent. But I kind of did it in my mind. You memorize yeah. the beginning or the end of the sentence so that the you don't actually have an active rustling as you turn the page. But of course this is all irrelevant now because the iPad was invented, which did wonderful things. Because now I don't have to have a light source in my studio, uh, and of course that would oh. give out heat. And yeah, these I'm... things get warm. I mean, I've got yeah. a ventilation system in this one now, but there have been times in the past, especially here we are in Southern California, the temperature is 90 degrees outside and it would get very warm inside the studio. So especially if you had a lamp on, which you needed to, if it was just a regular yeah. page. So the iPad came on, you know, you can be in pitch black and you can read and it's, it's wonderful. So the iPad has been that again. Thank you, Steve Jobs, for the iPod and the iPad <laughs> and uh, gifts to us. So I was really struck by what you said about, but by the time you got to the end of the book, you were deeply, deeply connected as readers are, and as you must have been in a special way as a performer to the characters of Aubrey Maturin. And I can kind of Im imagine the way that might have gone. I, I listened to your narrations and your Aubrey is very big and sort of physical and Stevens, this kind of sounds very physically slight, but you must have had to build up some idea of what the recurring secondary characters were going to be like. So, so talk us through how you might have done that. Where possible... I, I, I can remember back in the 80s when I was doing books for the blind and there was a green room and there'd be actors from yeah. the West End there as well as broadcasters recording books and we'd stop in the middle for a cup of tea. 
and there was all, there was a dispute between whether we did character voices or not. And there was one fellow who I think worked for Radio 3 said, no, oh, no, you just read the text, which must have been very boring. Um, I tend to sort of go halfway. I like to produce characters. I don't want to make them too broad. It depends on the book. Yeah. So I very much want, because also it helps the listener identify yeah. the people. You know, if mm-hmm. it's, you know you've got mm-hmm. he said, she said, that's fine. If you don't have he said, she said, and lots of writers don't use that, somehow you've got to differentiate it. So it's, yeah, you know, you use a high voice, a gruffer voice, a lower voice. And that develops, of course, if you have specific characters who are recurring and so on, you, you need to give them some level of authenticity. Uh, and I always remember describing how I came up with a lot of voices. Uh, I did a lot of work with um, Charles Dickens early on, not with him, of oh. course, but reading his books. <laughs> yeah. He would give his characters such good names, you know, Mr. Jolly, which halfway <laughs> described the whole character. But he would also quite often spend a paragraph describing the characters before they've opened their mouths. Wow. Mm. So I've got used to a way of absorbing what's coming, if you like, and yeah. going, okay, this works. Now, you can't always do that when somebody's introduced. So a lot of that is sort of as far as you can, it, and it's hard, and I'll tell you why it's hard in a series sometimes, yeah. but in the book that you're reading, you, you check through to see if there's anything that tells you where the person's from. And there are yeah. obviously with British books, there's a lot of class structure, you know, yeah. um, uh, education, age, uh, things like that, but class. Uh, and and we have a lot of options with regional stuff. Americans do to some extent, but not in the sense that we do, where one village can sound different from the village up the road. So um, there's a lot of variety that you can pick on. And if you can identify where somebody's from in the book, then that's great, because then you can go to that source. The problem with a series, of course, is that you may choose, if there's no clearly identical place they're from, you might give them a name. This voice fits in. Yeah. Um, to the way they're speaking, and then you find in the third book in the series they're from the other end of the country. Swansea. The, yeah, classic, the classic thing which happens in books, and I think it happened to me very early on, uh, you know, if you have a, I'm trying to think what a name would be, well, O'Brien or something, you know, you, you, yeah. the, the guy, oh, was O'Brien, and, and the way he's talking, okay, I'll give him an Irish accent, or whatever, and then you find he's from Scotland. <laughs> you know, oh, yeah. chapter 42, he's, he's, oh, he was, you know, his childhood in Glasgow. And you're going, oh, for heaven's sake, oh, why didn't no. I see that? So that's a good lesson in doing your research, reading the book. Yeah, but okay. um, for the most part, I will, I will try to get a sense of how it's written. You know, if, yeah. if you've got, you know, he came from such and such a town or village or region, then you've got a rough idea and you don't have to be terribly specific, at least give it just a touch of something. Uh, but if you've got something specific, you use that. And if you don't, all you've got is is you know what the character feels like, the way they're speaking, yeah. um, what their um, situation is in in the class structure, um, and and the way. I mean, I, I get a lot from watching old movies and stuff like that. Yeah. Even watching you know, Master and Commander or whatever, you yeah. you uh, you get a sense of how different people spoke, and um, and that's 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 the way I do it, and. I guarantee I got some wrong along the way. So the one I have in mind is Killick, and it, yeah, and, and and in my mind, Killick sounds I don't know, not 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 like you, you've done a, a rummy Killick, a Killick with a yeah. Birmingham or a West Midlands accent. And after the first ten seconds of going, wait, 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 wait a minute, I was like, this is really good. The kind of wheedling, complaining, whining tone yes. of Killick, yeah. And I was wondering, was that chance, or I don't know, have, have you got a friend with a Brummie accent somewhere out there who doesn't know that you've turned him into Killick? <laughs> I know, I do, the Brummie. I'm going to try and think what the Brummie accent is like. You know, it's, it's Roy. Roy, you don't know. <laughs> it's Uvri, you know, Roy. But it's yes, I don't know. I think I've just seen a lot of or heard a lot of Brummies, and there is something <laughs> about which which it was like this, you know, and he, he's, he's yeah. you know which this and which that, and and I think. There's, there's also in my head, I, I put, I put familiar faces of actors mm-hmm. or people I know, because that's one way people say, how do you remember the voices? Oh. And usually it's because um, mm-hmm. I've pictured them. Because what we're doing when we're narrating, we're, we're playing the whole movie. And I don't mean Master yeah. and Commander, the movie movie. Yeah. I mean, right. it, the movie of the book that we're reading is playing in our heads. When you've got a group of people talking, you know, three or four people I, I can sort of see them moving around the room. Yeah. So I know who's speaking when and where and to whom and what the reaction of, because you're doing both sides of the conversation. So I'm reacting uh, as the listener at the same time as I'm being the speaker. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful 
it's a wonderful game to play, but I, I, I hook faces on to people. Uh, and I can't remember what I would have chosen for, uh, you know, way back when, but I think that's part of what came out that I just saw this guy and the way he talked, as you said, yeah. it, for me, that worked. I, I don't know if it's mentioned in the book where Kill It comes from. I suspect he came from London. There's, there are some things about his characterization very, very deep in it later on that makes me think he was from London or East London. But yes, the, later on, you see, that's that's another one yeah, of those Scottish-Irish yeah, yeah, exactly. things. You know, yeah, exactly. In book 12, he was born in East Cheap and... <laughs> You know, yeah, oh yeah, exactly. well. Well, he met. He hung about with a lot of Birmingham types back <laughs> yeah, in the day. Exactly. And... <laughs> now, Simon's a narrator working in the contemporary world with contemporary technology. It was really great as well to hear from Sue Dennis talking about Patrick Tull's process. Now, we know that Patrick worked closely with his engineer, a lady called Kath Gormley, at Recorded Books. Mike, you and I did talk briefly to Kath a couple of years ago. And so it was really fascinating to hear Sue describe the dynamic between Patrick Tull and Kath as she described for us how a session would run in Patrick's recorded book sessions. Usually what he did was he read the book um, first, cover mm-hmm. to cover, mm-hmm. um, and then made a few notes um, and then um, went back in. Um, you know, he and Kath could estimate uh, how much they would actually be getting done um, in a particular session. And um, and so he would be going over that um, before he went into the studio. Ah. And then when he got into the studio, he was just focused on, you know, we got to rock and roll and we'll move forward from there. And and the two of them were like that. They were very focused on getting the work done. Mm. Mm. And and just to paint the picture, like the, we're talking about the days when r- recording meant recording, and the, at least at the beginning there would have been actual tape, and you know a studio is not like and just somebody it up, right? R- yeah, right. not not just sitting in front of a computer reading into a microphone, but this was like you know real right. professional with the headphones and looking and looking at your engineer, and yeah. a difference of opinion about a word could stop things, right? right? Right. We heard some of those stories, which were yes. hard. <laughs> right, because yeah. n- neither of them were going to give, uh, you know, give quarter. And oh, I love it. Uh, we had, we always had the updated Oxford, and and that was what he relied on. And right. um, they might have a few comments to one another about what was going on. Ah. Uh. And I remember watching the, the there's a video clip of him reading at a meeting somewhere, and he he quickly launches into a dramatic performance. Like it's there's about six or seven seconds of him holding the book in front of him, and after that, his whole body is active and is acting the thing. So I'm guessing that there must have been, you know, if he's got like, you know, a, a pencil in his pocket or car keys in his trousers or something, I'm, he he must have been a nightmare to keep still and quiet and to eliminate all of those. That would get all him before he walked in. Oh, okay, okay. Ah. Ah. He did have a pen or a pencil with him, but yeah. everything else was L- yeah. left behind. <laughs> yeah, he exactly. her, her quote that stands out for me, she said, in those recording booths, you could hear a mouse fart. So, <laughs> yes, that sounds like that. <laughs> and so she, you know, she was really on to that, you know, what kind of material was on your shirt, how you moved and, and all of that. That was such a, you know, in those booths back then, you know, you, you didn't have the, electronics to edit it out you had a razor blade and tape and exactly wow exactly. Um, let's talk about the laughs as well because one particular thing that people often say about tull is he manages to land the jokes so tell us something about how come patrick tull seems to hit the jokes so well well the first thing that people don't really realize is that an actor and, and a you know a narrator in an audiobook is an actor yeah is the first thing they have to do is they have to get the jokes yeah and Patrick O'Brien jokes are subtle you know like there's so many things obviously Stephen is a truly hilarious person he has a brilliant yeah. brilliant wit but part of what's interesting about Stephen's wit is he doesn't necessarily care that anybody else in the room gets it <laughs> is that he is saying something for himself. And so like for, uh, an example would be is you have an Aubreyism and then st- so where so Jack has messed up some cliche and then Stephen is helping him to finish the cliche. And of course, 
we know that Stephen knows what Jack is trying to say, but he is not going to say what Jack is trying to say. So Jack will say, you know, don't look a, a gift horse in the and he'll hesitate. And Stephen will say in the eyes, you know, <laughs> and of course, he knows what the expression is. And so it's you could, as an actor, say, make the choice of Stephen doesn't know where Jack is going. He's trying to figure out. And he goes um, uh, in the eyes. I but what what Patrick Toll knows is that Stephen does know and he's messing with Jack. Yeah. And so that is a subtlety in how an actor portrays a part. And I'll, and I'll say one other thing, having auditioned actors, I mm -hmm. did a couple of sitcoms when I was in film school. And so you got a bunch of jokes. And what you hope is that you get an actor to come in who can come up to the material so that every joke that is in it, they get and they can deliver on. But that's not the real goal. The real goal for a great actor is that they will plus your material. They will find lines within your material that act, that weren't funny. You wrote yeah. them. You know they're they're not funny. There's no joke there. And the way they deliver them, they're instantly funny. And you think of like Julia Louis Dreyfus is a perfect example of someone who is always plussing the material. They're always giving you a little more. Will Ferrell is making things funny that aren't funny on the page. And so a great actor, and Patrick Toll is a great actor, is finding all these things. And in particular, I would say. All of his supporting characters, like Killick, is hmm. so damn funny yeah. in the hands of Patrick Tull. And he could just have like one line, you know, where he just says something a little grumpy to one of his mates as he's leaving the room or the way. And, and, and the Killick, Jack and Steven relationship is fascinating because they are his superior in every single way. And he has, as they as described in the books many times, a moral superiority over them. And so how you navigate that relationship because they're both scared of Killick, yeah. you know, and they both can yell at him. And to getting all the humor out of it, that's where Patrick Toll's genius really shines. So right at the top of the show, we talk about how Patrick O'Brien fans came to love the audiobooks. And the audiobook narrators, including Patrick Toll, were a big part of O'Brien, you know, of, of the O'Brien fandom world and the O'Brien world at that time. We asked Sue Dennis to tell us some tales about that time and what that was like. Um, during the 90s, um, he had started the books and then uh, suddenly got a call from Norton um, saying that Patrick O'Brien was coming over. Remember when he was doing his first tour? Right. And um, so we met him at, he was doing a, a lecture at the Yale Club, and I think that was the first time we met him. Mary was a very quiet person, uh, but was right there. Um, Patrick was very formal mm. um, and and um, uh, very British, you know, more wary, I would say, of people. Um, mm. I, one yeah. of uh, when he uh, did, uh, for instance, the Yale presentation, someone said to him, "Where did you get?" all of this information about, about the ships. And he said, from doing extraordinary amounts of research for years. Yeah. And that was like a, a bold statement of fact for him, but I bet it came off as a little bit of a sort of prickly remark. Yes. To somebody who was just <laughs> <being friendly. laughs> exactly. Someone who was, you know, beginning the questioning um, right. uh, of the speaker, but um, it was yeah. uh, it was a uh, it was an interesting introduction. Wow! And the, them being quite private people, and him, as you say, being very British in character. How did they find it being in the midst of the great kind of uh, this was this was the era of the American Patrick O'Brien mania, and yes. he was a massive celebrity, and he was in this kind of a new other culture. How did, how did they respond to that? You know, he, he seemed to be fine, but he was very, he was always very reserved. Yeah. Um, and the, um, I'm trying to think of whether it was the first or the second trip that, um, that Norton sponsored that, that Norton brought him over for, but he was here in New York and there was some sort of a kerfluffle going on with Starling, who was his, uh, I don't know, editor, uh, a, whatever Sterling was at, 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 at uh, Norton. Yeah. And um, they were going back and forth and back and forth. And we came up and suddenly Patrick and Mary disappeared. And somebody said, where Patrick and Mary? And somebody else said, oh, they're outside. They're taking a cab. 
And apparently the, the kerfluffle had been about the fact that there were thunderstorms and he and Mary were supposed to be boarding a plane to go to, I think it was Charleston. And the flight had been canceled and they couldn't figure out uh, trains to get them there in time. And so Patrick just grabbed Mary's arm and said, come on, Mary, and walked out and got into a cab and said, take us to Charleston. And the guy did. Oh, wow. (laughs) (laughs) One of the things that um, when we were first listening to the books with him, uh, I commented and I said, do you think Patrick O'Brien sails? Mm. And he said, "Um, I would assume so. I don't know. But this was right before we were going to the Yale Club. Yeah. And he said, um, you know, but you're going to meet him. Perhaps you could ask him. And um, so we got there and we were standing talking to him. And, and um, I asked Patrick if he had ever sailed. And he said, no, he never had. That um, his work was always based on the extraordinary amount, again, of research that he did, yeah. Yeah. Um, which he and Mary did together. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, I said, oh, okay, thank you. And he looked at me and he said, why are you asking that? And I said, cause you don't talk about motion in battle. Ah. And he said, oh, I said, there are waves. Ships are going up and down. Yeah. You don't mention that. You know, it, your battles are there. They're very exciting, but they're, they're that static. portion of it is that, yes, they're static. Yeah. And um, a few years later, we um, were at a dinner on the Rose with um, Patrick and Walter Cronkite, Dennis, who was the editor of Science Magazine, mm. and the Grossmans. And um, that question came up, or, or that... Um, Walter Cronkite said um, something about, do you sail? And, and Patrick O'Brien said, no, I don't. And, and so he said, well, we have to fix that. And so um, uh, Walter Cronkite invited him out to sail on his ship. And I think and it was my understanding that that was the first time he'd ever sailed in his life. Wow. That's with Walter Cronkite. Wow. As we think about the interaction between narrators and authors, we began to wonder, is there any sign that authors write differently when they know their work is going to be read aloud? It's a really interesting question. I do know, for instance, that there are books that I listen to where they make little edits because they know that it's being listened to rather than so they so as you sit listening to this book, You know, like Stephen King's On Writing, which is a fantastic book on the writing process. He talks, he knows that it's an audiobook. So, because he reads it and he's saying, as you're listening to this audiobook. So, so I know that goes on. I know for me, when I write, and I know many, many writers who do this, is you have to read everything you wrote aloud. So, I always read everything I write out loud because the mistakes that you make become super, super clear. Because something that looks like it flows with your eyes, as soon as you put it in your mouth, it doesn't flow. And a part of this is because I, I write screenplays. Yeah. So obviously, it's, it's, it's an audio medium. But yeah. still, going through the rhythm is something that I know many, many, many writers do. I thinking about this the other day, because I heard about somebody who'd, who was writing books solely for, as audio books. And I think it would be yeah. a quite different thing to do, because you're freed from the, the need to be forever saying... Um, uh, you know, Smith said, Jones said, or, you know, you, you, and you can put more emphasis into, into the words. Uh, I think the, what it's done for me, because I still write principally for the, for the written word, as opposed to the spoken word, yeah. is, it's just more little things like, you know, you get to an end of a sentence and someone's interrupting you, put those three little dots, ellipses, they're called. Yeah. They, they just don't work for, for audio because the narrator, right. you know, finds it hard to bring that into it. So I've stopped doing those. It's helped me to make my dialogue flow better. I'm thinking in the back of my mind, how's that going to sound when David reads that? And do I really need to say that it is Carlyle said when he can put that into his accent? And for the book, I can just make it a little bit more obvious by, um, you know, by the context and so on. So I suppose that's the main thing. I think it's helped my dialogue. 
I think it's yeah. made me think about my punctuation. We don't speak with punctuation. We, we, we write with punctuation. They're, they're right. quite different things. I don't know whether it's changed. I, I know there has always been a school of author that says it's good to read your words out loud. Yeah. Just because mm. sometimes you're not aware of your repetition and, right. and things right. like that, that things like punctuation or whatever, it, 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 it highlights certain things. I understand why an author wouldn't necessarily want to do that with a whole book. You know, maybe they don't have to strictly read it out loud, but be aware of how it's going to sound out loud, if you like. And, and I know there are authors who, who don't, who, who will write just write, and it becomes a little turgid sometimes. Mm. Many times repetition of words. I mean, there are styles of writing that require repetition of words, but it's when they're accidental but become very prominent when you're repeating. Oh, I remember a couple of times uh, last week reading and there were repetitions of, of words in sentences that just made it clunky. Yeah. And I remember thinking, that was in one of the instances of, oh, this could have done with an editor. <laughs> I'm guessing if you're listening to this show, you're probably already pretty close to or, or actually are a fan of audiobook narrations of Patrick O'Brien's work. But we wanted to ask our guests as well, if we've got any of you perhaps hooked for the first time on the idea of audiobooks, besides the O'Brien canon, what other audiobook performances would they recommend? Let's hear from Steve and Simon and then from Sue. So you're asking me, I, I literally have over a thousand books in my yeah. audiobook library. <laughs> okay. So so it's a little bit hard for me to go through. You know, like I know you're having Simon Vance on the show. I've listened yeah. to Simon Vance do dozens of books. He has a fantastic voice. I think he did the James Clavell books. I think he did. Um, and, and so, you know, you get used to sometimes these voices, these uh, narrators become your friends. I, yeah. I don't think I've ever decided to buy an audiobook solely because I love the narrator, but there are definitely some narrators that make me much more likely to buy it. My guess yeah. is most of the people that read Patrick O'Brien, you know, the sharp novels and E.M. Forrester and probably Rudyard yeah. Kipling and some of those guys. And those are all lots of fun. Another one I mentioned a while ago is uh, a book I've read many, many times, which is Stephen King's On Writing, which I still say, yeah. along with Anne Lamont's Bird by Bird, are probably the two best books on the writing process. Uh, Stephen King's in particular is like half autobiography and then yeah. half just real nuts and bolts about writing. And it is so good and highly, highly recommended. My goodness, I'm rattling my jewels here. What, uh, yeah, uh, people haven't heard audiobooks. It's understandable. Um, they're, they've had an up and down reputation over the years. They, they're really, they're getting really good now, uh, but yeah. they've been through sticky patches from time to time. I don't know how I'd introduce somebody who has never listened to an audiobook. Some people, you know, they'll go after the names. You know, we're talking about, yeah. uh, you know, the author reading their own book. They might do it that way. If that's the case, I, I, you know, Neil Gaiman and have a go at that. They'll go for actors and actors, mm -hmm. named actors. And, and there are a few named actors who have actually done not a bad job, but many of them are terrible because they come from a different discipline, you know, stage yeah. or film, which yeah. requires completely different. Thought. And it's, I, I've heard about actors who've gone into the studio and they've come out of it going, I'm exhausted. How can you do this day after day? Because it is, yeah. it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. Yeah. Uh, and 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 it requires a different kind of focus um and it's not it's not just about the voice in in terms of where to go i think i think you ask yourself what do i like reading yeah what do i think i might like having read to me mm. would i like to have a mystery novel would i like to learn about world war ii would i like to learn about this or is, is this a, a fantasy world do i like fantasy do i like or even horror, you know, or there's a huge market for romance um, and, mm -hmm. and, and even erotica. Would I like to listen to that and then go on to one of the download services? Uh, of course, the big one is Audible, but there are many mm -hmm. others. And, and look at the genres. And you can sample a couple of minutes of each one. Um, oh, right. And sometimes, sometimes that doesn't give you a good picture, you know, that... Uh, a narrator might sound good for a couple of minutes because they've got a really interesting voice, but a really interesting voice after four hours becomes really boring. <laughs> if you know what I mean. So it's um it's a difficult it's a challenge, but give it a chance. You know, you find something you think you like by a certain narrator, 
follow up on that narrator. I know people would like to say, well, go listen to this book. <laughs> but yeah. I know that if I said, I, I, you know, I won awards for the Alan Moore book, Jerusalem, but I know that is not a book that everybody would like because it's right. weird in many ways and I would okay. not want to turn people off. Yeah. So right. it's finding a good, a good narrator can make a bad book good, yeah. you know, but a bad narrator can destroy everything. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. you know, uh, so Mike, getting towards the end of the show, as, as the Lubbers Hole resident super fan of audiobooks, tell us some of your final thoughts here. Well, it, you know, it, it's clear from the interactions that we've had, you know, over the years with our listeners that there are many huge fans of audiobooks, you know, of audiobooks in general and the canon especially. And and while the debate on the favorite narrator might not have quite reached the level on the debate of who should play each one of our heroes in the, in the next movies or streaming series, <laughs> You know, at least not yet. There okay. are significant numbers of listeners who have their favorites. As a matter of fact, this episode was partially inspired by one listener, Jeff Allen, who introduced us to a canon narrator, Rick Jerem. I, I hadn't heard of him yet. And he asked if we could discuss audiobooks more on the podcast. Now, I, I listen and read both when we're working on a chapter, but Really, truly, audiobooks have spoiled me for the written word in most cases. You know, even when I was back at seminary studying Koine Greek, you know, the audio learning for me was so much easier than the written. And uh -huh. I absolutely love accents. I absolutely love the characters, you know, primary and secondary in books. So, you know, audiobooks are definitely my go to. Fantastic. So, where are you now on the, the big favorite narrator question? Well, you know, I, I remember in the Harry Potter heyday, there was this big debate over Jim Dale, kind of the U.S. Yeah. narrator, versus Stephen Fry, the U.K. narrator. And that debate was really massive. And, and, and being in the U.S., I was a tried and true Jim Dale fan to the point that I bristled a bit if the movie actors, you know, weren't close enough to his character voices. It was wow, like, no, that's no, really no. tough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're getting that wrong, right? And I've always been a huge Patrick Tall listener. I mean, that's when you introduced me to the canon. Yeah. You know, I, I came into the canon along with, you know, not just the books, but Patrick Tall helping me every step of the way here. So as Part of making this episode, though, I've, I've learned, you know, even much more that different narrators of the same book, as I mentioned earlier, bring out different parts of the books in different ways. And I really appreciate all of our listeners advocating on behalf of their favorite canon narrators. As a result, I tried Simon Vance reading Master and Commander, something that would have been akin to heresy in my younger days. I had just finished listening to him read Dune cool. and, you know, I loved it. And then I thought, you know, then you said, Hey, Simon's going to be on the show. And I was like, Oh, seriously. <laughs> and I, you know, I've got lots of Simon Vance books in my, in my audiobook the library. So, you know, I, I love him. I love his reading. I just never had taken the plunge with O'Brien. So I've decided now that on my next circumnavigation, I'm going to start from, you know, 1 to 21 with Simon Vance reading the whole way. Good man. Now, I finished Master and Commander. I went back to my Libby app. That was the, you know, the only way I could find Master and Commander read by Simon Vance here in the state. And, and I went to grab Post Captain and I learned that, wait a minute, my library only carries one Aubrey Matron book read by Simon Vance. No problem. You know, I'm going to go buy them. But, but wait. You know, I just couldn't seem to find them. And then I learned that for some reason, Patrick Tall is now the only authorized audiobook collection of the entire canon. I I've heard that this is coming from the estate of Patrick O'Brien or whoever holds those rights. And I was really deeply saddened. I mean, we no longer have Patrick O'Brien. We yeah. no longer have Patrick Tall. Let's not I mean, we we got a lot of people who love this, a lot of people who are, you know, continuing to get into this. Let's have some more choices of ways to experience the canon. And so, right. you know, I would invite listeners to join me in, in sort of pushing to say, hey, let's open up that narration aperture a little bit. 
Yeah. I mean, it, it seems a real shame that we have less choice now than we had when the O'Brien audiobooks first came to the world. And let's face it, you know, there, there are dozens of different ways to play a Boccherini quartet, and you can get audio recordings of many different versions. So why not have the same thing, that same kind of diversity of interpretation when we get to hear our books read aloud? I think that would be a great step forward. Hear him, hear him, hear him. <laughs> we only have one movie. You know, perhaps there's another in development. And we know that O'Brien thought it would be really nice to have a woman narrate the series. I'd love to hear that. You know, I'd love to have all the narrators available, as I've said, so that we have these more ways to enjoy the canon. Yeah. I've got to say that for me, you know, I'm, I'm going to borrow uh, shamelessly from Arthur C. Clarke's famous third law of magic in Profiles of the Future when I say that to me, audiobooks are indistinguishable from magic. <laughs> you know, and they're a good magic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a magic that I'd like to see available for everyone. I don't believe any of the narrators would get paid any more if their works were available. Right. Um, you know, now that may vary for the people who hold the rights. I don't think any of the narrators hold those rights. So nobody's making any money if they can't sell them. And if nobody's making any money, it'd be nice if even like the Gutenberg Project or fan fiction, they just started posting them out there. Okay, if you can't sell them anymore and that's not going to change, why not make them available online so we can all enjoy them? Absolutely. And we'd love to hear from listeners on this as well. Again, we got some great input from our listeners and especially our Patreon supporters, Rob Boughton. Rob, if you're listening, you gave us a long list of narrators. You get the uh, official Dubbers Hole Award for having the longest list of narrators and I think also the longest chronological career as an audiobook listener. And share online wherever you're at, on Reddit, in the Gun Room, on the Aubrey Matron Facebook group, the Patrick O'Brien Facebook group. Um, let's have a conversation about where else we could go to broaden the range of fantastic audiobook narrations that we have to help us bring these books to life. Now, we've really enjoyed putting this special episode together. We want to say a huge thank you to our four guests. Let's begin with Steve. Thank you so much, Steve, for coming and joining the show. Um, here he is now to tell you how you can stay in touch with his work. We have all sorts of plans coming on the cinephiles. By the time this airs, I think we're doing another British ish film, which is Mary Poppins is coming up on the cinephiles. Oh. And I just watched it with my son who hadn't seen it since he was really little, man, that movie's really good. Oh, it's good. And in addition to the cinephiles, if you happen to be a Star Trek fan, we have been doing very, very deep dives first on the original series and then on the animated series. And I had to say, I think there genuinely is a connection between Absolutely. Kirk, Spock and McCoy and Jack and Steven. You know, getting to talk to Simon Vance, I was like a kid in a candy shop here. And, and we asked Simon, you know, what is he working on next? And you can see more about him and his work at simonvance.com. And here's what he's got coming up. I am so happy to talk about Patrick O'Brien. Yeah. Even though it was 16 years ago that I finished, it's probably the about the most enjoyable time, partly because I got so much good feedback. Yeah. And I've made some great connections through it, some good friendships. It, nice. was, a sort of, it was a sort of turning point for me in a yeah. way. I, I wish, because it does happen, that a lot of times I, I wish I could record books again, often because I think I could do them better, often because yeah. I just enjoyed them so much. And yeah. I think the Patrick O'Brien books are a series that I enjoy so much. And I would like to go back again. I uh, just finished a fantasy book, which I might have referred to <laughs> anonymously. I do have a, the short Daniel Mason thing this week. Next week is interesting. There's a TV series out there called The Chosen, and it's the life of Jesus based right. on... Right. Bible stories and so on. A very professionally done uh, product. And they came to me years ago with the first book and based on the TV, based on the TV series, based on the Bible, I've just got uh, part three. So I'm doing that next week. And of course, you can go search for Simon's work as well on any of the audiobook platforms that you're that you might be uh, subscribing to. You can also follow Chris Durbin's work by going to his homepage, www.chris-durbin, D-U-R-B-I-N.com, or he's on Facebook, www.facebook.com forward slash Chris Durbin author, all one word. Now, 
be careful. You might just find yourself in the midst of a new nautical historical fiction series. You might just. And of course, it's been great to reminisce with Sue Dennis. Thank you, Sue, for all of your time and your your kindness in joining the show. You might encounter Sue from time to time on the Facebook Patrick O'Brien or be matching groups. And it's been great to have her and all of our four guests with us today. So a big thank you to all of them. Um, Mike, we've covered a lot of territory. Take us to the end here. What are your final, final thoughts? Yeah, well, it's been fascinating to walk through the world of Patrick O'Brien's audiobooks. It's been great to understand more about how narrators work through the audiobook process, how authors work with narrators and the impact that they have on listeners. I particularly love coming back to Patrick O'Brien and his thoughts yeah. on audiobooks, you know, moving from thinking that they should be read flatly with no characters, his thoughts on the joy that a woman narrator could bring to our enjoyment of the canon, and then hearing about his interactions with Sue and Patrick Tall, Tall who brings so very much to the characters and who clearly love those characters as much as we do. I can only wonder what O'Brien would think today of the books, the audiobooks, the movie, and all the love that we have for his world of Aubrey and Matron today. Thanks to all of you for joining us. Thanks for continuing on this journey with us. Please let us know if you've decided to try an audiobook, Patrick O'Brien or otherwise, who was the narrator and what your reaction to it was. I may sound a little strange, but one of my favorite things to do is to listen and read together at the same time to get myself even deeper into the stories and the characters of this world that we all love so much. Amen, Mike. Really well said. Thank you. Ian, I've got to say a very special thank you to you. I mean, this has been, you know, a complex undertaking. I've done corporate takeovers with less moving parts than, (laughs) you know, conceiving this, lining up the interviews. I mean, your spreadsheet of of how we pull all this together, just brilliant. Hats off to you. I I don't know how you do it and do your day job as well. Oh, thank you. It's been a pleasure. It's, It's been a massive pleasure. And as you know, Mike, nothing good in life ever happens without a spreadsheet. So there you go. (laughs) <laughs> so it's been fun, right? Covering this whole landscape of audiobooks. Speaking of stories and characters that we keep getting pulled back into, speaking of the world that we love, Mike, we've got a whole new book on the shelf. We have The Hundred Days coming up next. So, what do you say, either on paper or in audio, to a little bit more Patrick O'Brien? With all my heart. Mike, nothing good in life ever happens without a spreadsheet. So there you go.